Is this thing on? We began um, bombing in 15 minutes. Favorite Ronald Reagan line ever. <laughs> there we go. It looks like we're this. It looks like we're live. And so this week, um, we have our friend Ken Burnside back. Thank you for coming back, Ken. Um, Thank you for having talk me, Julia. About science fiction weapons and battles and stuff like that, which of course is you know such a prominent feature of science fiction, uh, at least in the media. So. Um, so let's see. Before I get you launched on on your favorite topic, there, Ken, <laughs> tell us tell us how, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and and how you know so much about the stuff. I design board games uh, about space combat, and one of the board games that I designed is called Attack Vector Tactical, which is available through game stores uh, throughout the world. And Attack Vector Tactical tried very hard to make a board game that was the most realistic and definitive uh, model of spaceship combat with getting all the physics right that I could possibly do and still have it be played by human beings without computerized assistance. Uh, it is actually a fully three-dimensional uh, spaceship combat game. In the process of designing this game, I stumbled across a mailing list called SF Consumel, which has a whole lot of game designers and people who really know the ins and outs of uh, the physics of space combat and the, thermodyna the, the thermodynamics of space combat, and a couple of people there who work for the mil who you know, work as contractors for the military and the like also helped out, and mm -hmm. it just turned into an ongoing series of I would solve a problem, and just as I would get through the exaltation of solving a problem, somebody else would show another interesting problem. I'd solve that one and work it on in. So, um, can you um, do me a favor and um, write us that the the name of that uh, group in the chat bar so I can just write it down? Done. Awesome. One moment, I'll be right back. No wonder I wasn't understanding it. <laughs> 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 like, it rolls off the tongue, but it doesn't spell that easily. <laughs> mm -hmm. What have you got there? This is one of the sets of playing pieces from the game that I wrote. Oh, okay. Now, I don't know how well you can see it on the screen here, but this is an image of a thermodynamically uh, constrained spaceship. Notice that at the bottom of the, of the ship, you have that little spiky protrusion at the end. Those are all radiators for getting rid of the waste heat of your magic fusion drive. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what the difference is between uh, unobtainium and handwavium? <laughs> What's the difference? Head Wavium is the Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. We're not answering this question at all. Any kind of faster than light drive, other than possibly an LQB or warp drive, is pure hand Wavium at this point. Uh, unobtainium is, we can't actually build a fusion engine that would actually provide the thrust described in the, uh, uh, the, 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 the thrust we needed to actually make this all work. But if we could, it would behave like this. One of the reasons why we can't do it is because of thermodynamics, and thermodynamics is going to become everybody's favorite curse word after the end of this after the end of this hangout. <laughs> I can see, I can see that coming. Um, so one of the questions that you asked me in setting this one up is whether or not you should make your spaceship combat two D or three D. Right. Now. Hollywood would have you think it's all uh, 2D, and Hollywood would have you think it all happens in nice, convenient, both ships on the uh, screen distances. We don't actually do naval combat in modern naval combat with both ships within visual line of sight of each other, and we haven't done so for 70 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we haven't done so since the dawn of the aircraft carrier. Um, space combat, they're not going to be within Mark 1, Mod 1 eyeball distance of each other. The real question on space combat isn't 2D versus 3D. It's actually 1D versus 3D. No. And how's, the reason, how does that work? Okay. 1D works... The reason why it's 1D versus 3D is the constraints of weapon range versus how fast your ship can change position and changes vectors. Most people like to think about spaceships having, you know, really significant amounts of thrust. Well, there's a rocket equation that basically says that the total amount of energy, here we're getting to thermodynamics again, and pre pre prepare to deploy curse words, the total amount of energy that your engine can produce is finite. You can either move a lot of reaction mass at a very low at a low rate of speed behind your ship and get a lot of thrust out of it, go th but go through your reaction mass very quickly, or you can put a little bit of reaction mass going out the back of your ship at a very high rate of speed 
at which point you get more fuel efficiency, but your thrust is measured in uh, in flatulent gnat farts. <laughs> Well, luckily you don't have friction to contend with, so that might actually be useful. That is indeed very useful. Uh, the ion drive that we used on the near probe uh, to go on out to uh, Vesta and Ceres uh, has thrust that basically would not... You know, it, it has thrust that, you, that, that is probably less than the breeze coming off of your air conditioner, moving a four or five ton probe. Yeah. Um, you actually, it is much more fuel efficient to thrust for a very long period of time at a very low rate of thrust than it is to do it all at once. Um, it is much, it is also generally more time efficient to do it that way. Um, the reason why the fuel efficiency is so important is I want you to imagine the space shuttle and remember that great big huge uh, fuel tank on the end of it that's actually bigger than the orbiter. Mm -hmm. 96% of the space shuttle's launch mass is fuel. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want you to imagine that instead of a jet fighter having a fuel fraction of about uh, 10 to 15 percent, it's you have a jet fighter that is sort of strapped onto this, you have a jet fighter that's actually strapped onto a space shuttle main fuel tank. Right. Not, not the image that you normally think of when you're thinking of your fighters zooming around and your heroes doing heroic things in heroic space. Right. Uh, so your choices for maneuver boil down to are you going to be fuel constrained uh, at which point your ships are barely going to maneuver at all uh, the way I sometimes describe maneuver with properly with properly physics model thermodynamically constrained fusion engines is it is the graceful duel of parking dodges uh, of parking garages dodging by continental drift flinging tomahawk missiles at one another <laughs> so so um Looks like a fish, uh, moves like a fish, steers like a cow, or...? Uh, looks like a fish, steers like a building, dances like a continent. Okay. <laughs> uh, when, you have a, when you have a situation like that, your constraint on weapons boil down to what is the longest range weapon that I can do that will actually affect them, at which point you eventually get to the point of... You, you start doing the numbers and you eventually get up again to uh, parking garages dueling with uh, Tomahawk missiles and dodging by continental drift. Right. Uh, so, this comes to the next big trope in space. It's dark. You can't see anything. Which turns out to be so vastly horrifyingly wrong that it is almost impossible to explain it to somebody who, who, who is not willing to accept that what they know about it is, is wrong. It's it, it, I liken it to teaching somebody, to getting somebody to go from Ptolemaic planetary motion to Copernican planetary motion. Okay. So what are the implications of that? How does it apply? Uh, you will see an enemy spaceship vectoring towards, your, towards its objective weeks to months before it arrives. Okay. Yeah. And not only will you have weeks to months before it arrives, because you can actually do a chromatic, you can do a chromatograph on the temperature of its exhaust velocity, uh, and you can take a look at its brightness. You can tell away, you can tell roughly how far away it is by its brightness versus its proper motion across the sky. And with that and the temperature, you can actually get a pretty good idea of how much reaction mass and how energetically the reaction mass is being thrown out the other end of the ship. Mm -hmm. And once you know that, you actually know how heavy the ship is. Okay. And these are all equations that, uh, well, I would like to say that any good junior high school student could probably do with a calculator. That's probably junior high school student from when I was in junior high. It's probably a high school senior at this point. Um, yeah. But this is one of those things that just makes you go, huh. Because the other thing that, that applies in space is there is no horizon. Yeah. Um, right. And... Even if the engine is turned off, you'll have a very good chance of detecting the ship because assuming that the ship actually has human beings on board, uh, human beings like living in temperatures that are basically between about 280 Kelvin to about 305 Kelvin. Um, if you go much colder than that, everybody's coffee freezes and you have to wear parkas to do your job. Anything hotter than that, and well, you know, you're wondering why you can't just turn on the damned air conditioning. Right. So, 
when you want to when you want to spot a manned spaceship, you do a whole sky survey. Uh, and you chill your telescope down, and you're looking in the IR bands, and you're looking for something that is radiating between about 280 Kelvin to about 305 Kelvin. You might want to have a little slop on there to go down to about 270 in case they're wanting to do something clever, uh, and you might want to go on up to about 310 just in case you know they're having a problem or something along those lines. But that is like looking for the great big huge orange elephant in the. Uh, it's like it's it's like taking an elephant, painting it neon orange putting it in a domed football stadium and turning off the lights and saying, can you see the elephant that's glowing in the dark? It's bright orange. <laughs> it's the only thing that is elephant-shaped that is bright orange in this entire field of view. <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, well, certainly if you're thinking about the kinds of science and, and uh, you know astronomy that we have now, uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm continually impressed with how much we can learn about stars and planets and mm -hmm. and the qualities of those planets and the cores of those planets without being anywhere near them and you know only mm -hmm. using the the deductive power of our of our you know the the readings of our instrumentation. So it seems pretty clear that that if you were going to be going for hard realism in that regard, you would have to calculate through all of the things that you have been describing. Or you can take some, or you can take some very simple rules of thumb. Uh, the other rule of thumb that you have is that your spaceship probably has some sort of power generation system on it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a very long calculus proof that I'm not going to try and do over a Google Hangout for you. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> but it is in one of my, but it is in the Attack Vector Tactical product, and you can actually look it up and follow all the steps if uh, you are so inclined. But the long and the short form is that for every watt of energy that you are generating on your ship, you have to dissipate four watts of waste heat. Okay, one watt of energy. All right. Equals four watts of waste heat. Now, that means that if you have the... Uh, this is going back to those spikes that you were showing to us a few minutes ago. Indeed. Uh when, uh, it, for every watt of energy that you're generating, you have to do, you have to you have to dissipate four watts of waste heat, and because of the uh, Boltzmann constant and the loss of thermodynamics, uh, you have an issue where the uh, where the cooler your radiator is, the bigger it has to be. Uh, the relationship between radiator surface area and radiator temperature is a fourth power effect. So. If you, were want, if you were wanting to make your ship constrained by thermodynamics and it has onboard power generation, it has to have radiators, and those radiators uh, are going to either uh, those radiators Ooh. are either going to be very big and very massive, uh, and very cold and, and cool, which means they're harder to spot, except for the fact that they'll possibly be including stars if it's close enough, or they're going to be very small, very lightweight, and they're going to be using liquid sodium or liquid or uh, liquid uh, lithium as their coolant. Which has a melting temperature, which has a melting temperature of about 1,600 degrees Kelvin, which once again is a temperature that's done, that, that does not actually exist anywhere in the sky for when you're looking around things with your IR sensor. Right. I see. I see your point. So, um, so so far it looks like we've been looking at at um, detection and drives and and, and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so one more comment on the on on the dimensionality. Uh, do you think, just for for folks who have been arguing about this for years, that uh, putting aside for the moment the idea that well these two spaceships won't be within eye shot of each other at all, they'll be mm -hmm. like at extreme distances. Do you think that the Babylon Five model is more effective at portraying space battles than the Star Trek model? Yes and no. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a brief diversion before I explain that. Um, the where you actually have your range constraint in space combat is weapon range. Okay. Uh, making a laser weapon that can do making a laser weapon that can actually deliver enough energy to a spot point on the target to actually harm it is a very tricky engineering challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, the laser that is in your CD-ROM writer. Is somewhere around 0.1 percent. Is somewhere around 0.1 percent efficient. Once again, we're getting back to thermodynamics. Except in this case, thermodynamics is actually helping us make the space combat interesting. Uh, you need to deliver enough energy with your laser to 
harm the surface of the enemy ship, which may or may not be armored, and may or may not have sensors or other fragile things on them that can be uh, fried off. Mm -hmm. um, that will put a constraint, that plus the wavelength of your laser, will put a constraint on how far out your laser can go. Uh, shorter wavelengths, the closer, your laser, the closer your laser is to the UV end of the spectrum or uh, the X-ray end of the spectrum, the longer, the, the longer range it will be. And to the very extreme ends, if you can actually make a synchrotron-tuned uh, linear accelerator X-ray laser uh, using grazing incidence mirrors made out of lead, of all things, uh, and you can actually make something that is precisely aligned enough, and I'll get to the problems with that in just a moment, you can get a laser that can actually shoot out, you can get a laser that can actually do, you know, melt the armor off of the front of a tank, uh, that'll go out to a couple of light seconds. Okay, so that's pretty far. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> by the way, handy rule of thumb, Earth to Sol is 500 light seconds. 1 AU is 500 light seconds. So that, that's a handy sense of scale for just how long that beam is. If you end up having to drop your wavelengths down to shorter wavelengths, um, you end up dropping the weapon ranges down considerably. Um, you can actually get you can actually constrain weapon you can actually ex uh, get weapon ranges down to a couple of thousand kilometers um, at that point. Mm -hmm. And the rain and there will be a diffraction limit on the laser, and beyond that diffraction limit, the uh, energy that the target receives will fall off by one over r squared. Uh, this is built into the weapon tables and attack vector if you ever want to look at it, and you can actually look at the wavelengths of the, laser that, of the lasers that I use to build those tables. Okay. So, uh, um, all right. So, tell, tell us about the consequences of that for, for television shows. Okay, for television shows, sadly what this means is that a laser duel is really boring. <laughs> lasers don't miss. Missing something with a laser is sort of like missing something with a flashlight. Um... And that problem I was talking about, about your power generation and your lasers, if your laser goes up to 20% efficiency, that means that every joule of energy that you're delivering to the target is four joules of waste heat that, that is being trapped in your laser system and must be gotten rid of some way on your ship. Right. Uh, your laser is not going to make a visible beam across the, uh, across the vacuum of space any more than right. it makes a visible beam without a handy smoke cloud on, in a football stadium. And there will be no warning that the laser has been fired until you're actually hit by it, or unless you're actually looking directly at it and see the flash. Mm -hmm. uh, which brings us back to my favorite t-shirt, the one that says, Warning, do not look into laser with remaining eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so your lasers are going to have a range constraint. The other major family of weapons you're going to have is going to be a projectile weapon, either a kinetic mm -hmm. weapon or a missile, either a coil gun round or a missile, um, uh, or possibly even a chemically propelled missile, uh, a chemically propelled uh, bullet round. The assumption that you should make on all of these is that, is that they are guided. Nobody will be firing ballistically targeted, see, uh, ballistically targeted uh, kinetic weapons or projectile weapons at anybody in space. Um, we're getting to the point now where we can just, we're getting to the, we've been to the point since, you know, the 1990s that we can actually make GPS guided bombs that have no warhead on them. Uh, they just hit things because the GPS uh, receivers have gotten so cheap that we can now put them in cell phones. Right. Uh, it's not quite that simple for making a, uh, you know, for making tar a targeting tracking system that will fit under the, that'll fit into the warhead of a missile, but it's close to that point. Mm -hmm. Your, Missile will be guided, and your constraints on the missile will be one of will be twofold. How much power on board do you have for your guidance tracking system, and how much power and how much fuel do you have on board for making course corrections slash building up your velocity towards the target? Uh, speaking of velocity, we'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, but what will usually happen with an accurate model of space combat is that you'll have missiles launched from long range. And you'll have lasers that will be that will be doing one of, that will be doing three different possible missions. Mission one is you defocus the laser to as wide a band as you possibly can, and you're going to be throwing it at your missiles, or you're going to be throwing it at the ship that launched the missiles, in the hopes that you're going to be uh, frying the sensors on board that ship. Because if you blind the target, they can't shoot you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually something that we already do with laser designators with uh, tanks. Okay. Um, 
I have a strong suspicion that the first thing, the the, 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 the first truly practical point defense weapon that we ever do, that you know that involves lasers, will actually be a uh, sensor killer, uh, rather than rather than something that actually damages the target. Uh, the, 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 the energy threshold needed is about two orders of magnitude less. So you have missiles coming in. You can either try and blind the ship that is guiding the missiles so that it can't launch any more of them. You can try and blind the missiles themselves uh, in the hopes that you can then outmaneuver the course that they're on before they get there. That is mm -hmm. a risk, depending on what your thrust is. Or you can wait until they get closer and just try to fry the missiles uh, and you know keep them from hitting you. And when you fry the missiles, you actually want to fry them in a way that causes them to veer a little bit off course again so that you don't have to maneuver too much. So what you're saying to, is, is that you're actually trying to affect the guidance systems of the missiles rather than to damage the missiles themselves. The first, the, the first order kill is going, to be kill the, is going to be kill the guidance system. The second order kill is going to be uh, hopefully make something on the missile detonate so that it turns into a bunch of smaller chunks. Mm. Um, I'd mentioned kinetic weapons before and uh, impact speed, and here is a handy rule of thumb, and I'm going to type this into the chat room. Uh, an, object tra an object impacting at three kilometers per second delivers kinetic energy equal to its mass directly converted to TNT. Directly converted to TNT. I see your point. Uh-huh. Now, if you don't have a feel for how fast three kilometers per second actually is, uh, Mach, uh, uh, one kilometer per second is just about Mach 1. Sorry, one kilometer per second is just about Mach 3, my bad. Okay. Mach 1 at sea level is about, 300, is about 330 uh, meters per second. Mach 3 is just under 1,000 1, meters per second or a kilometer per second. Uh, so Mach 9. Now, how fast do things in space go? The short answer is very. Yeah. Uh, Orbital velocity around the Earth has a has an orbital velocity of about seven and a half kilometers per second. Depending on the angle of the or depending on the angle of inclination of the orbit and what's going this way and what's coming that way, you might have you might be nearly at rest to one another, or you could be doing the head-on collision with a net velocity of fifteen kilometers per second. Right. How much damage that uh, uh, now how much damage that mi that missile does goes up at the square of the impact velocity. So, if you want to convert missile, if you want to convert missile velocity to TNT equivalent, multiply the mass. Uh, take the impact velocity, divide by three, square the result, multiply by the mass of your missile. Okay. And by pulling this equation out on David Weber, uh, <laughs> I pointed out <laughs> I pointed out a problem, and I'm bringing this up not to not, not to knock on David, but to uh, help other authors avoid this problem. David had a pair of 78-ton missiles. He was very kind and gave the mass of the missiles, uh, impacting a uh, force field at a quarter of, at a quarter of the velocity of at a quarter of c. Okay. To knock a hole in it, so that a couple of megaton yield nukes could get close enough to a ship to go off. So, we're going to pull up a calculator real quick. C is three hundred. C is three hundred thousand kilometers per second. <laughs> Sounds like it would have been a rather larger explosion than all that. Divide C by four. What do you get? Uh, I don't know. You do do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ah, come on, this is fun. <laughs> okay, for various definitions of fun. 300,000 divided by 4 is 75,000. 75,000 divided by 3 is 25,000. Is 25,000. 25,000 squared is a very large number. Yeah. <laughs> 625 million. 625 million times 78 tons. We get, in round numbers, 50 gigatons. <laughs> That's numbers, a lot. <laughs> in round numbers, each of those things slamming into the force field 
delivered about uh, 48, uh, delivered just a hair under uh, 50 gigatons of energy to the force field so that it would let a measly megaton yield nuke get close enough to the, uh, 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 to the target to hurt it. Don't yeah. let this happen to you. <laughs> well, you know, okay, so, so this is an interesting question because I think that um, it, it often depends upon your audience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some folks out there, uh, like you and, uh, and the and folks customers. who hang out on the uh, uh, SF Consum L uh, board are going to be deeply caring about these details and others mm -hmm. are not going to be caring quite so much. Uh, but it sounds like, uh, in practical sense, that, that force fields aren't going to be very effective against uh, an attack of this nature. Well, if you want to make science fiction realistic, I've probably just made you decide that thermodynamics is a curse word. Um, I, I I probably just I probably just did the equivalent of coming in and kicking your uh, coming in and kicking your puppy. Well, you know, here's the thing. I think um, I I am actually very untroubled by this, <laughs> but it's it's no. uh, largely because I don't spend a lot of time writing battles in space. Uh -huh. uh, exactly. Uh, on the other hand, so you know, there are people who are going to be very interested in writing battles mm -hmm. in space, and there are many people out there who are um, fanatically dedicated to the idea of realism mm -hmm. in, in science fiction and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And they um, should buy my and they should buy my game. <laughs> and they should buy your game, sure. Because um, it is probably the most concentrated reference they're ever going to find, and it will give them an understanding of this thing that reading a textbook and working equations will not. So okay, so but so I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of um, juxtapose a couple of things here. So well, you've got you've I, got. I was, can I can I cut something in real quick? Yeah, sure. If you want to make space combat interesting, knowing yes. where you have to break the rules is important. <laughs> yes, that was what I was just uh, something like what I was going to say because yeah. um, you. There's this, this, there's this ideal of accuracy and realism, and then there is also the uh, the idea that there has to be a certain kind of metaphorical understanding that a person can have in order for a story to be very effective. Mm -hmm. um, there has to be stakes in the battle for you that the, the reader will actually care about, and the cheap and easy stake is you have to care about whether or not the protagonist is going to live through it, or whether right. or not something the protagonist cares about is going to live through it. Right. Um, and if he doesn't and, know that he's about to get hit by a laser at a distance of two light seconds, and then all of a sudden, you know, he has no front end of his spaceship and he's totally dead, that's less optimal than some other options. Fortunately, by the way, fortunately that two light second x-ray laser requires that you build a micrometer precision aligned linear accelerator that is about 13 kilometers long. Well, so the other thing that happens is that uh, we say, okay, um, it, I guess it goes back to your unobtainium and hand wavium uh, mm -hmm. distinction. How much of this is, is something where an unknown technology might come in in the future and cause this to be more, uh, more obtainable than it appears to be with our current models? For thermodynamics, the answer is not very likely. Uh, I think we are much likelier to find a way around Einstein's theory of relativity, which is the most uh, consistently validated scientific theory of, uh, of the last 200 years, mm -hmm. than we are to find a way around the laws of thermodynamics, which are the, which are the ones right. that are causing you know, all of the cursing. That being said, if you're making a piece, if you're making a, a, a science fiction story, Making a way for your ship to shunt all of its to shunt all of its waste energy, or put its waste heat into another dimension, is one way to do this. Yeah. Um, and Glenn Cook actually did this in one of his books in the 1980s. Um, the other thing you can do, and this is actually one of the things that happens in attack vector, is that ships actually pull their radiators inside the hull, inside the armor plating, and run off of batteries and heat sinks while they're in combat. And one of the things that happens is that when you are no longer capable of fighting, your automatic viable surrender signal is to extend your radiators. 
Because once your radiators are extended, you're, you're no longer doing combat grade thrusts, and anybody who wants to shoot your radiators off can do so. Okay. Um, this is one model of radiators, and it's one that I liked because it allowed the naval conceit of the, of the Age of Sail of uh, being able to strike your colors. You had asked earlier about comparing Babylon 5 to Star Trek. Yep. The pro Babylon 5 has a better movement engine in terms of ships actually maneuvering like spaceships, at least through Season 2, before they get rid of net or digital. Um, and starting in Season 3, the Star Furies and everything else started swooping around like airplanes. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, in uh, Season 3 on out, uh, the movement engine got a, got a little bit farther away. Uh, the other nice thing about Babylon 5 is that they did a good job of trying to, of even though you could actually see the energy weapons firing, they did a good job of making sure that what was stopping the energy weapons was actually armor. Um, there weren't, there aren't any magic force fields. You can't, uh, you, you can't reverse the polarity of the tetrion flow and route it through the main deflector dish to uh, solve this week's episode's problem. Uh, right, right. But the problem that Babylon Five has is the fighters. Okay. When Fighters serve two ma fighters have two major advantages in naval combat on the surface of a planet. And when I explain these advantages, you're going to go, yeah, neither one of those apply in space. The first advantage is that a fighter will move at somewhere between 50 to 60 times uh, the speed of its carrier. And in space, there is no up in space there is no top speed for the carrier. Mm -hmm. The second is that the fighter actually gets to go over the horizon, uh, drop its bombs, and come back. Or go over the horizon, shoot down the enemy fighter, and come back. There is no horizon in space. Right. Anything you can do with a fighter in space can be done more efficiently with a... Uh, can be done more efficiently with either... with what is effectively a cruise missile. Because you have to actually carry about four times as much fuel to get that, to get that fighter out there and back assuming the pilot and his life support system weighed nothing. <laughs> you, right. still have to, yeah. you, you still have to spend four times as much fuel to have, it to have it be recoverable and come back to the carrier than you do for a one-way mission. And fuel yeah. on a high-thrust regime is going to be 96% of the mass of the ship. Okay. So, so let's, let's move away from the large-scale um, mm -hmm. out in the middle of the space uh, sort of... Uh, details for a minute mm -hmm. and let's sure. talk about um, person to person battles or you know mm -hmm. um, Star Wars uh, people shooting bolts at each other and, and phasers set to stun and things of that variety. Okay. Um, it's been done a lot. It's done plenty of times. I, fi I find it uh, I find this sort of, I've been hit in the arm by a bolt of, of visible fire, and I don't have any kind of burns from it to be a little bit odd. Um, mm -hmm. But again, there's a lot of metaphorical stuff that's going on here, rather than um, realistic uh, stuff. Well, because of the nature of, because of the nature of, of needing to make it look good on a screen, your energy weapon, uh, your energy weapon bolts, regardless of whether it's Star Wars or Star Trek, always seem to move at about the speed of a Nerf crossbow bolt. Yeah. Uh, they don't move as fast as arrows do in the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't move nearly as fast as bullets do in the real world. And sadly, uh, thermodynamics is once again going to be a, is going to be an ugly, ugly, ugly word. Basic rule of thumb. It takes about one kilojoule of energy to cook, to cook, to cook an eight-ounce New York strip steak, medium rare. With me so far? Yeah. Uh, our best weaponizable lasers are about ten percent efficient, meaning that for every kilojoule, meaning that for every kilojoule of energy that you deliver down that you deliver downrange, you're going to be putting about eight to nine kilojoules into the hand of the person firing the weapon. Ah. Uh. To actually harm somebody with the uh, laser, you probably need to do cook. A, you probably need to do uh, the equivalent of cook a New York strip steak medium rare in one second, which means that you're doing horrifying things to the person's hand when they're pulling the trigger. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think that we're going to be seeing uh, slug throwers um, and ever more efficient th slug throwers for I won't say the I won't say the foreseeable for the near future and quite possibly for the foreseeable future. We will see them until something is enough better than them that it actually replaces it. And by slug throwers, you're talking about uh, projectile weapons. Ordinary gunpowder and uh, ordinary gunpowder and uh, and bullet. The Colt Model 1911A is still probably the best handgun ever made, and uh, it's 102 years old, and has not seen any significant design revisions since then. Um, the the likelihood that you're going to find something that is as small as a Colt 1911A, as easy to carry as a 1911A, and as effective as a 1911A, and is as cheap to use as a 1911A, and doesn't have the side effect, and has fewer side effects than a 1911A on the firer, is virtually nil. What about a uh, needle gun? Uh... Okay, uh, is this firing a? This is firing it's a long. projectile. Okay. But a very tiny projectile at a very high speed. Uh, most of the places I've seen them haven't gone into a lot of detail, but it's usually not gunpowder propelled. It's probably more like a some type of electrodynamic. Right. If you have efficient enough batteries, then yes, you can make a. Uh, uh, if you have efficient enough uh, capacitors, is a better way to put it, not just batteries, something that can put a burst of energy through an electromagnetic coil system in a short enough period of time, and you have good enough superconductors that the electromagnetic coil system doesn't actually inductively heat itself to the point where it destroys itself when it fires. Yes, you can make a Gauss. You can make a Gauss projectile uh, thrower that uses electromagnetism to do it. However, think about the amount of energy that you have to store and think about the complexity of making your cell phone work versus the complexity of making a bullet work. Uh, you have to have something in there that actually makes it more compelling to you to add the additional complexity. As to the needle itself, um, you want a projectile that, when it hits, will penetrate the likely armor that you're that you're going to hit. We discussed this on the first hangout that I was at, that I was with. Yeah. Yep. Um, narrowing the surface area of the point of contact does increase armor armor penetration, which is why a lot of people think about needle guns as something that throws it throws a projectile that's roughly the size of a knitting that's uh, sorry roughly the size of a sewing needle at somebody, at you know say Mach two, um, but. The problem with those is that you are going to run into a case of aerodynamic stability. Uh, the air resistance is actually going to slow that down a little bit more, and you eventually lose projectile mass, which also matters a fair bit. I'm not saying a needle gun can't work, but it will probably be it will probably be a specialized weapon, uh, like the equivalent of a sniper's rifle or an assassination weapon. Okay. Yeah. It is the perfect sort of thing to give your secret agent who is going against the Slarnian Confederacy and trying to figure out why those reptiles want to uh, steal all of our water. Mm. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, um. What is okay? So let let me see if you have a comment on on this other um idea. Mm -hmm. What one of the things that we talked about in the last uh session was um, sort of locating your technology historically uh, mm -hmm. to establish what kind of expectations could be held for uh, for for a battleground and, and the variety of weapons that might be available um, so mm -hmm. um, so is there a is there do you perceive that there is a natural sort of technology set at this point for a science fictional battleground or is there is it something like uh, do you feel that uh, that what we perceive as the expected technology set for a science fictional battleground is just completely unrealistic and we better start over if your perceived set for a science fiction battle is based off of uh, watching television then you probably need to start over. <laughs> um, however, 
let me let, let me uh, come to that question from 90 degrees off angle. If you want to make your science fiction battle scenes interesting as a novelist, mm -hmm. you need to know where the you need to know where the lumps under the rugs are so that you can tell so you can say hi, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain and wave your hands. Mm -hmm. To make an interesting battle, you need to constrain it by time. You need to constrain it by objective, and you need to and you need to have some sort of asymmetric capabilities between the combatants. Um, this is actually one of the things that causes a problem for a lot of science fiction writers is they don't actually think about that third part, the, the required asymmetry, uh, to make the, to make the story interesting. Um, that asymmetry can be as simple as differences in doctrine. It can be as uh, strange as differences in range. And once you get to the point where ranges get very, very long, maneuvers ceases to matter. Uh, I am very much, by the way, a fan of finding ways to constrain your weapon ranges, if not your detection ranges, uh, to short enough distances where maneuver actually matters. Um, you need to think about how you are. You need to think about how your ships are moving around the universe. Uh, it is an accepted science fiction trope that you can make a reactionless drive. Uh, the problem with reactionless drives is that some uh, is that some terrorist or uh, some annoying fan with a calculator is going to figure out what happens if you take that drive, uh, that reactionless drive that allows you to take your shuttle on up to the spaceship without having to worry about fuel fractions, get rid of all the people on the shuttle, pack the shuttle up with ball bearings and a little bit of high explosive, and you set that reaction drive to run until the engine runs out, and all of a sudden, it's not that hard to get uh, a C-fractional weapon. Right. Um, uh, one of the, uh, another website that people should look up is called Atomic Rockets, uh, and I'm quoted extensively throughout that website, and one of the rules on there is, uh, Burnside, is uh, Burnside's advice, also known sometimes known as Burnside's admonishment, <laughs> friends don't let friends use friends don't let friends use reactionless drives in their science fiction settings, uh, because reactionless drives more or less make planet crackers cheap and easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so think carefully about putting reactionless drives in your setting, and I'm going to step away from battles for a little bit and point out a and point out a plausible set of constraints that can actually make for interesting stories and possibly interesting sources of conflict. Okay. And this will probably take about five to ten minutes. So if you'd, if you'd rather I not do that, let me know now before I start. No, that's fine. Okay. <coughs> plausible near-future realistic drives uh, for, for tooling around the solar system will probably get you to thrusts in... It will probably get you reasonable thrusts in the magic range of four to eight milligies. And I say that four to eight milligies is, is the magical range, because when you are because below four before below four milligies, you have to basically do half orbits around the sun, kick your way up to a higher orbit, go halfway around the sun again, kick your way up to a higher orbit, and keep on doing that multiple ways around, which means that you get to do one thrust every six months at at Earth orbital distance. At about four milligies, you can actually maneuver free of uh, the sun's gravitational constraints. Between four to eight milligies, you have a wider range of launch windows and a lot more flexibility. Above eight milligies, up to about 500 milligies, or half a G of nearly constant thrust, between eight and 500, there really is no benefit to reducing your travel time. Uh, you can widen, you can basically be completely free of any constraints on when you leave. But there, but it doesn't actually shorten your travel time from going Earth to the from Earth to Mars or Earth to the asteroid belt. So four to eight milligies is also a re, is also a plausible range for reasonable for fusion drives and or high end ion minions. Um, and at four to eight milligies, you're talking about transits from Earth to Mars that will range somewhere around uh, four, that'll range somewhere between four to about ten weeks, depending on your launch window and how fuel constrained you are and how much fuel you're willing to spend. And those launch windows are going to be asymmetric. The return trip is not; it does not launch from Mars at the same time that it does, that uh, the outgoing trip comes from Earth. Mm -hmm. So, as a story constraint, imagine that you're telling a story about a about a ship. Oh, you've frozen there. I'm going to note to tell him he's frozen. I 
hope he comes back. <laughs> In mid sentence. Thanks. All right. Well, let's see. Thoughts from you two while he's um, getting back? Well, I'm finding it very interesting, but mainly I'm just learning at the moment since I've never really tried to write sci-fi. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, my my approach is is generally to try to focus on uh, human interaction or, or or personal interaction and and less to focus on battles. So, ah, seems like he's realized that he needs to re-enter the. the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and the thing as well, the thing is, scenes, like any, I don't know, the way I see it when I write anything that has to do with spec fic, whether it's science fiction or anything like that, even fantasy, it just, even if something is impossible, you just need to create a situation in which something is possible, or at least plausible. Mm -hmm. And then you have what you need in order to write the story. You just need to, you know, um, it, pulling it into fantasy, create a world with certain rules. As yeah. long as you stick within those rules, it, it works. It doesn't have to matter necessarily about how it's very incredibly specific or how incredibly uh, realistic you are. It's the story that matters more to me in any case. Right. Right. Which is why I was saying, make your story interesting first, then and know where you're hiding the physics. Sorry about but, the uh, technical difficulties yeah. there, Ken. Mm, not a problem. Uh, I had talked about the 48 8 milligy magic window for thrust. Right. Uh, did I cover how long it takes to get to Mars at that at that? Yes, thrust? you said ten, four to ten weeks from Earth to Mars, and that was where we lost you. Okay. Now, because the windows for returning for the return trips are not asynchron are not synchronous, you'll end up going to Mars. And you'll end up staying at Mars for somewhere between four and five months, and then you'll take the return trip back if you're doing the uh, whole if you're doing the whole sh the uh, the whole schmear. So that gives you a lot of constraints. It's actually that it, it gives you some interesting uh, constraints to uh, work with. It's actually not unlike the uh, journeys of the Indian men in the 16th century in terms of the travel time and duration. Um, on those. You know, uh, uh, with that thrust, your with that thrust and thermodynamically limited lasers and thermodynamically limited weapons, you can also get to the point where you can actually have interesting combats. And uh, the other nice thing about the low thrust regime is that the likeliest place that you're going to have combat, the ships are going to be probably relatively at rest to one another. So you can actually go back to that wonderful old beautiful standby of uh, strap on your jetpacks. We're going to go board the enemy ship. Hmm. Um, and this actually makes for much more interesting fiction, even if it makes for much less interesting naval combat. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I do, uh, I think you have an interesting point there um, that, that people should keep in mind, which is that, and I think this is also what Misha was saying, what you need to do is, as you're going into something like this, you need to decide what your constraints are going to be, mm -hmm. and and modify them at that point and, and think through the implications of them for a particular scenario that you are trying to set up, right? I.e., your I e. friends don't let friends use reactionless drives in their setting because there's an implication that most people overlook. Well, that's true. Yeah. And, you know, and you can always say, well, most people are going to overlook it and they're, and they're my audience. Right. I mean, we can't... We can't um, we can't underestimate the fact that Star Trek is enormous and hugely mm -hmm. successful and and breaks all kinds of <laughs> thermodynamics and 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 you know physics ah fie upon the physics <laughs> so um, so I think it's a very interesting balance right between mm -hmm. the kinds of very technical things that you're describing to us and mm -hmm. and I think that there's a general move in science fiction and fantasy at the moment to try to be more realistic and to try to mm -hmm. ground things more strongly in in a realistic uh, set of expectations is something that we can anticipate from our world mm -hmm. um, 
there's building off of that foundation versus there's building off the foundation of metaphorical significance that's been built up by the genre to this point. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a very interesting tension there. Yeah, the more uh, the, the more closely you hew to the, to the constraints of physics and want to keep in a situation where ship-to-ship -ship actions are actually interesting, mm -hmm. the closer you're going to come to finding a set of constraints that make attack vector possible. It is very, very easy to change one or two very small little variables in attack vector and go from having interesting and go from having interesting frigate duels where ships are fighting at a couple of hundred kilometers from one another and launching kinetic weapons and launching uh, and launching chemical fueled rockets at one another uh, at ranges where maneuver actually matters and where we can actually have a magic uh, mode on the uh, fusion drive that allows oh my god bone crushing thrusts in eighth of a g increments um, right if you change any of the constraints in attack vector, if you make the drive more realistic, if you make the weapon range, if you make the uh, the viable laser wavelengths shorter, uh, if you make the fuel on the rockets more efficient, you lose the situation that I built the game around, which, being a game as opposed to being a novel, is built right. around trying to give as many different options for a player to try that are all viable against one another as you possibly can. Right. Um, so my constraints are somewhat different from a novel's, but it's because I'm basically building up a bigger toolbox to work for everybody else to play with. Uh, but if you change any of those constraints, you quickly get back to one-dimensional space combat, where you have uh, ships firing lasers from a couple of thousand kilometers away while they are moving at six millijes. Uh, right. While they're doing full combat thrusts at six millijes, and it's not quite uh, it's not quite dueling parking garages. It's probably dueling tree slots. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, right. And I think that you find yourself in the position of having to figure all this stuff out because of the constraints of the game as you were trying to design it, too. Mm -hmm. um, because you were trying to design a three-dimensional game that can be played in a, in a three-dimensional space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is very interesting. So somebody who's somebody who's writing a novel is up against a, a, a sort of a different, mm -hmm. a, a different sort of uh, a, a different set of expectations in, in the viewer, and also a uh, different set of of uh, constraints of, of of different types. Right. Um, my my other piece of advice to a writer is: when in doubt, leave it vague. Yeah. Uh, well, there is. Well, I, I will. It, I will say that I leave things vague. I mean, mm -hmm. so for example, I do um, my stories that have appeared in Analog and mm -hmm. Analog Magazine have been about interactions between humans and aliens and, and misunderstandings mm -hmm. due to cultural and linguistic uh, misunderstanding. There's and no mention of the FTL drive that got them there. Right. It's and not relevant. For, yeah, and, and, <laughs> right? and, 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 and for that story, you need to know about the FTL drive almost as much as you need to know about whether or not you, you whether or not they're still using metric or English screws right exactly so um, so one of the important things for writers to keep in mind um, is that all of this stuff is great and it's it's important if you're setting up a scenario like the one that you were talking about with the with the massive explosion that was supposed to break down the force field so that the tiny explosion <laughs> could hit the ship uh, you know, you do end up with with scenarios like that, um, and when you're trying to work on space battles, and uh, you don't want to run into a large problem like that, it's good to do your research and, and come and listen to this hangout, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but one of one of my other favorite memorable oopses uh, in reading in a uh, science fiction novel. Uh, was Roland Green's The Peace Company, where he describes a nice, gentle shuttle docking at 30 kilometers per second. <laughs> uh, one of the rules in attack vector is uh, docking, ramming, and flying in formation is the title of the rule. The invisible, not written in their uh, parenthetical note, is and how to tell the difference. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, this is something I'm going to show off just a little bit again. This is not just only a piece of art, it's a playing piece, and you notice that it's a cube. Mm -hmm. In my game, the ships can either lay flat, 
like this, mm -hmm. like perpendicular like this, or you can put them in a little tilt block like this and show mm -hmm. them angled up and show them angled up or down. Uh, and by doing so, you can get 30 and 60 degree angles, which is the way that I actually do the visualization on the game board, so that human beings can actually play this, not computers. I see. Uh, and I'm bringing that up because it's also really useful to have as a set of props when you're setting up your space battle for figuring out where characters see things. Uh, if, you're, if you haven't served in the Navy, uh, you might try to come up with some random uh, submariner, submariner lingo about a bearing at such and such degrees by Mark such and such, right. uh, and this, that, and the other. Um, knowing how to actually figure out where you're going to see something and knowing how the vectors are going to be crossing does actually, can, does actually inform how the battle passes are going to go. Um, and when dealing with vector mechanics and doing battle passes between naval actions, there are two kinds of combats. And the two kinds of combat is the uh, head-on collision. Yeah. The two forces have opposing vectors. And what I call the freeway merge. Mm -hmm. And if you actually want an interesting combat, you really want to find things in your setting that will make the freeway merge happen. Uh, because at, high, because at very high speeds of combat, combat becomes an academic exercise. Uh, it's, not that the, it's not that the numbers are uh, not incomprehensible. They're very comprehensible. It's just that they're very, very large. <laughs> I see. Uh, and uh, I'm going to throw an adjective at you, Doc Smithian. As in, as in conveying the essence of, Do of E. Doc Smith's space operas. Ah. If you have antimatter weaponry or, fa or, or or things along those lines, your universe sneers at merely Doc Smithian weaponry. Can you write that in the uh, chat bar sure. for me? And we are basically out of time. Okay. But uh, <laughs> because life must go on. But thank you for thank you for getting us thinking about all these interesting things. Mm -hmm. And uh, people uh, can obviously. Ah, all right. I will write that down. Uh, uh, people will be able to look up your your game, no doubt, if they're curious about it. By the way, I do consults on books that deal with science fiction, uh, that deal with space combat. Okay. To, I, I, I I will do consult as basically a paid reader to go through and tell you to go through and say, okay, this is what you want the space combat to do. This is what you're describing it doing. You might want to consider changing this, 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 and this to actually get the results you want while still obeying the laws of physics. All right. Well, that sounds, uh, sounds like you're well equipped to uh, help out with that. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks to you all for, for coming and we will wrap a, uh, up the hangout at 12.01. <laughs> um, do we have any uh, suggestions for topic for next week? Um, let's move away from world building a little bit and talk about trade. Trade? Trade. Grubby, okay. grubby, Trade's evil, filthy... I can yep. totally go with that. Yeah, let, sorry, let's, let's move away from military and talk about trade. The, the grubby, grubby, evil, mercantile... Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Mercantilistic, mercenary, filthy lucre type thing. All right, I'm ready for that. I should probably ask my husband to be a, a guest on that one. Because <laughs> he's, uh, he's in finance, so... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> He'll have a lot of commentary on that. Anyway, all right, thanks so much, and 